Um, okay, we've got uh, participants continuing to roll in, but we don't have, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a quick hour. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with um, some introductions and some housekeeping, and then we'll move right into our presentations. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation of the Kirk webinar series entitled Single Use Plastic Bans, Process and Partnerships. My name is Leanna Hauser. I'm the Waste Reduction and Recycling Manager at Johns Hopkins University, and I'm also the Vice Chair for the College and University Recycling Coalition Board. I'll be your moderator today, and just a heads up, this is my first time hosting a webinar without our illustrious Eric Calverson, who was uh, one of our staff members at Kirk. He recently moved on from his position, so please bear with me. There may be some hiccups along the way. Um, but I'd like to thank Jamie Peavy, also a Kirk board member who is providing support on the back end. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Kirk, the College and University Recycling Coalition is a member-based organization that works to grow collegiate recycling and waste reduction efforts by fostering technical information exchange and networking opportunities between the staff and student leaders implementing programs on campuses across the world. Today's program is part of our free Kirk webinar series, which is designed to highlight innovative campus programs and provide trends and perspectives on a broad range of operational and educational topics related to collegiate recycling and sustainable materials management. Today's program is the first webinar in our 2022 series. We have a few housekeeping notes to go over before we start. If you have any problems with your audio or video during the webinar, you can visit Zoom's support center by visiting support.zoom.us. To avoid background noise, we've replaced all of our, all but our panelists lines on mute. We encourage you to submit questions at any time by using the Q&A section, not the chat box, to type us a note and we will read as many as, of these as possible out loud at the end of the presentations. We will do a Q&A after each, uh, both of the presentations. If we are not able to get to your questions live, our panelists will try to respond in writing. For general comments or notes, please feel free to use the chat function in the dashboard. Copies of today's presentation slides will be available to download in a few days, and a recording will be available as well um, on the Kirk website, www.curc3r.org. So now on to the show. Single-use plastics are pervasive in our environment and on our campuses. While some plastics may be recyclable, only 9% of plastics on average are recycled, leaving the rest to be burned, buried, or clogging waterways and endangering the most vulnerable populations of our world. Additionally, the upstream impacts to environmental justice, public health, and our environment are staggering. Thankfully, a movement is beginning at institutions of higher education, states, and municipalities to ban these items from other spaces. Experts in today's program will discuss how they navigated the decision-making process to ban single-use plastics, identified and collaborated with key stakeholders across their institutions and built strong partnerships for success. Speaking of collaborations, both of our presentations today will be team efforts. We'll start with a presentation from Kevin Brim. Sorry, let me advance this slide here. Um, Kevin Brim, Colleen Reagan, and Amber Sexton from George Mason University. Then we'll move on to a presentation from the College of the Atlantic to hear from Tina Drupa, Ellie White, and Izzy Segovia. Kevin Brim oversees all university composting and recycling programs as the Recycling and Waste Management Supervisor in George Mason University's Facilities Management Department. He works collaboratively with university stakeholders, especially the Mason Sustainability Council's Circular Economy and Zero Waste Task Force and the Office of Sustainability to advance zero waste infrastructure, eliminate some of use plastics and polystyrene, and decrease overall waste generation while improving diversion. Kevin also serves on the College and University Recycling Coalition's Board of Directors. Colleen Reagan supports the implementation of George Mason University's single use plastics and polystyrene ban as a resource responsibility and zero waste specialist in the university's Office of Sustainability. She is a member of the Mason Sustainability Council's Circular Economy and Zero Waste Task Force and works closely with the facilities recycling team 
to support sustainable purchasing, composting, donation programs, zero waste planning, and the implementation of reusables across Mason's campuses. Amber Saxton is, is the Sustainability Program Manager for Campus Efficiencies and works with others on the Office of Sustainability team to advance institutional sustainability and create a leading model for change at George Mason University. As a board member for the National Wildlife Federation, she helped create a new Plastics Reduction Partner Certificate Program, which secured ASHE STARS credit for participating universities. Thank you, Kevin, Colleen, and Amber. As a reminder, if you have questions to ask of Kevin, Colleen, and Amber, please submit them in the host. Please submit them in the Q&A section. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and allow, I believe, Colleen to, to begin the presentation. Hey, Leanne. Sorry, Kevin. Oh, Kevin's going to begin. OK, great. Yeah, Thank no you. No worries. Uh, I apologize. You can't see me. I'm afraid if I touch anything, you'll lose me. So Colleen looks better than me anyway. So her pitches up in my place. So thank you for having us. We want to talk about Executive Order 77. I'll go to the next slide. Um, as you know, as you all may not know, but um, George Mason is a city within a city based on the number of students, faculty, and staff we have. So next. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is the partnership um, we made with sustainability and so many others throughout our campus. And a lot of things that we did before the executive order that we had in place already, such as collecting um, plastic film and our re uh, recycling initiative. But this more importantly was most effective because of the partnership we made with all the people uh, throughout our campus. And so some of the things that uh, I first and foremost we implemented was I had all the uh, trash liners removed from our low residue bags, which was our Slim Jims that we had collecting uh, white paper, mixed paper. Um, this uh, came out to be like 50,000 pounds per year that just by removing those liners that we kept out of the waste stream. Um, along with that, as you see in the picture, uh, we started collecting both our um, plastic recyclable bags that we use on campus as long as it wasn't badly uh, soiled uh, or dirty. And we collect those at the end of the day every day. And we uh, actually at the end, we do, we do the same thing like our cardboard bale, we bale it and we make a bale. Um, along with that, we also have gay lords in those partners and stakeholders that we work with throughout campus. We put gay lord bins throughout the campus for them to put that LDPE and plastics and hard to recycle plastic. We collect that as well. And we do the same thing. We make bales and on average, we do about 18,000 pounds per year of uh, LDPE plastic, which our vendor takes and give us money for. Uh, one thing that I did focus on was getting rid of uh, the use of plastic bags to even collect recycle. And we use a lot, uh, all my staff use these reusable bags um, to take both paper, all our dry material, paper, white paper, mixed paper, instead of using plastic liners, we went to these reusable bags. Um, then the last thing we focused on too to help with our efforts was to um, co-locate trash bins and recycle bins around campus as opposed to having, for example, 15 trash cans in a parking lot every 15 feet or so, 20 feet. Um, we co-located bins and eliminated a lot of them to Instead of 15, maybe we only got three now and forced the students to walk to those areas to eliminate, uh, put their recycling trash in. Uh, which brings us to um, how we go about diverting and diversion and collection and uh, all the different programs we run on campus. Out of all the things you see here, this bullet point, uh, I must say I'm proud of the Patriot Packout. Um, this is a collaborative effort we have with uh, both sustainability and uh, housing, Res Life. Uh, it gives the students an opportunity to donate uh, non-perishables and things that we, uh, things that they accumulate during the year that they can't fit in that car to go back home, as you, you guys may very well know, they bring in so much stuff. So instead of throwing all this stuff in the trash, we collaborated with housing and sustainability where we can divert over 13 pounds a year of donated materials that come directly from our students. And we uh, set up a trailer and work with local uh, Goodwill to uh, divert that, uh, all that 
you know, non-perishable and things that they can't take home. Uh, which brings us to more or less our diversion rate at Mason. As you can see, our numbers aren't that great compared to our um, neighboring Virginia schools. Um, again, I remind, like I said, we're like a city within a city, which makes it tough um, with all the, you know, the amount of people, faculty, staff, and students we have. But again, this just shows you our diversion rate compared to our um, neighbors. Uh, with that being said, uh, after the ban and moving forward, uh, the plastic ban it really allowed us to accelerate this process, uh, bringing in you know better equipment such as the what you see here, smart belly, uh, big belly, and these smart machines. This station here alone eliminated uh, twelve re recycled trash cans and bins off of this one patio by Starbucks alone. Um, and then again, after the ban, um, we could actually move forward um, with uh, more um, expectance of getting better returns on our revenue, um, looking at our contamination through sourcing and our endless recyclability and reorganize our facility yard to um, be better equipped to sort and handle what we were bringing in. So with that being said, I will pass over to Amber. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, yeah, and so Kevin kind of walked you through uh, what you can do uh, through, a, through a ban, um, some of that pivot of the acceleration that can happen from a ban. Um, I'm gonna walk you through what we did do. Um, slide. So at Mason, uh, as Kevin was saying, uh, we had that period before the ban even took place where it's really important to build partnership. Um, our ban actually went into effect last March, uh, March uh, 23rd, 2021. And um, it was not uh, necessarily expected. Uh, so it was um, a, a bit of a, a, a shock, but at the same time we had been working so long to reduce um, you know, our waste profile that and we had, we had sort of been ready for these types of action. So um, we were actually able to capitalize. And a week after the executive order came out, we created a, a Circular Economy Zero Waste Task Force uh, within the Mason Sustainability Council. Um, and so we hit the ground running and we had to submit a plan uh, within six months to the DEQ, the Virginia DEQ. Um, so these are, I'm not going to get into these because this is somewhat of what Colleen will talk about, but this is some of, you know, just the action that's happened since that plan went into effect, um, including, as Kevin mentioned, those big belly uh, smart uh, trash cans and, you know, a bunch of um, uh, supportive action. So uh, slide. Yeah, so I'll just mention that I, I think the key to, um, you know, our approach was we really need to partner because the pace of this uh, executive order was, was very fast. Um, so partnering for progress, um, both with you know, Virginia schools and the Vashi uh, Collaborative, with the Department of Environmental Quality itself, uh, with organizations like National Wildlife Foundation, and then within our own campus also, I would say the key um, to, to having any kind of progress was uh, this uh, Circular Economy Zero Waste Task Force where Office of Sustainability and Business Services um, really partnered together. Um, so I'll say that um, the co-chairs, uh, myself and Pascal Petter from Business Services, um, were able to have a lot of uh, meetings and, um, and do a lot of engagement together, um, but a lot of action happened because uh, this is more of a purchasing focus. So Kevin went over a little bit of the zero waste focus, we really wanted to start tackling sourcing um, with any ban, obviously most of it's about purchasing. Um, so what after the ban did for purchasing was allow us to focus on a buy less, buy better uh, type of approach. And so we looked at source reduction, we had to assess our purchasing and that was that first part of the ban really that six months was assessing and, and trying to figure out strategies. Um, and so I, I would say that's key as you're looking at better alternatives you want to think about the life cycle of a pro of the products that you're going to replace uh, the products you're getting rid of with, because um, extraction and production of those products, uh, you know, if you're thinking about circular economy, can be more 
uh, impactful than even the disposal. So as we looked at uh, better alternatives, we were really, because of the speed, we had to go with um, things that could be rapidly put in place. Um, so within a few weeks, we created a reference list for folks and, um, and we um, were able to create some standards on sustainable sourcing um, as well. But um, this transition was so rapid that we had to lean on a single uh, use items at first. Um, but we also were able to um, now, I would say, focus a little bit more on the best alternative, which is reusables. Here's some of the standards for those single use items that I mentioned from that reference list, which we shared with purchasers, uh, vendors, and then also peer institutions. Um, we also leaned heavily on third party certification, as you can imagine, we had two to three weeks to put together this reference list of thousands of products that vendors, you know, could uh, could look at for through third party certified compostables and what we were worried about was PFAS, obviously. Um, so we had to lean on BPI certification, CMA certification, we worked with those organizations. Um, and the industrial composters. I think that was one of the keys to um, the success is just, you know, again, partnering with other folks. We also wanted to make sure that any plastics that were replaced um, were not, um, like plastic bags, for instance, were not replaced with uh, paper bags that would have um, ill effects, you know, and deforestation. So we wanted to lean on the FSC certification or 100% recycled content. Um, I will say that the other, uh, um, you know, source reduction again is the other the other uh, effort that we have, um, and then I just wanted to point out that we did partner. Um, I'm on the uh, NWF board, um, as Leanna, Leanna said. Um, so we were able to actually beta test this certification program we've been working on for a number of years there through our um, ban. And so we've had this uh, as something that we've been working on for years, but we actually held it back so that we could actually kind of walk through what a ban would be like for a university. Um, and I'll just say that um, it is now available, this plastics reduction partner. So uh, we were able to secure ACI credit for it, um, ACI STARS credit. And, um, and yeah, so it is available to universities who have been doing this work and want credit. And I'll just mention also breakfreefromplastics.org is a great organization. And then Break Free uh, uh, and then Plan uh, also has a great pledge and guides for campuses as they also look to, um, to break free from plastics. So all of the, all those groups are together in that break free from plastics movement. Um, I will now hand it off to Colleen uh, to talk more about next steps. Yeah, thanks, Amber. Um, yeah, so uh, after sort of the initial implementation over the past couple months, uh, we're really focused now on implementing the in-house hauling pilots that we've been planning. Um, so that includes like a front of house composting pilot at a Starbucks location on campus and a glass recycling pilot. Um, and really focusing on like increasing Mason's capacity to haul these things to partner facilities. Um, we're continuing to work with Free, Free State Farms, which is that industrial composting partner Amber mentioned, and the compost, Composting Manufacturer Factors Alliance to field test and certify additional products um, that are known to break down safely at Free State's facility. Um, we, through the process of sort of like inventorying single use plastics, uh, we, we've been working really closely with fiscal services. So um, we're continuing to support their efforts to, um, you know, build um, Mason's capacity for selective sourcing and sustainable purchasing. Um, business services, who's been a main partner with the task force is really committed to eliminating single use plastic beverage bottles um, from Mason's campus over the summer. So that is a huge next step for our campus that's uh, really been beneficial um, through this um, sort of state mandated process. And yeah, and, and a key sort of, um, you know, program we're really excited for is implementing our reusable to go pilot at um, a Mason dining facility. It's a grab and go facility on campus and just continuing to work with campus stakeholders and collaborate with them and fiscal services on creating trainings to support 
um, individual purchasing on campus that eliminates single use plastics. Um, yeah, um, so we started those office hours um, initially as a way of directly communicating with campus stakeholders who were, um, you know, like facing kind of unique challenges with purchasing on campus and, and um, you know, communicating about the shift within their own units. And we're um, continuing with those moving forward be, um, because they provide a really great opportunity to discuss like our university waste infrastructure, um, what kinds of reusable and single use alternatives are available to, to, to them and, and really, um, you know, some of the social environmental justice concerns that we have for Mason's campus in terms of, you know, over 85% of our waste is sent to Covanta's waste energy incinerator in Lorton and um, it has negative health impacts for surrounding communities there and just being able to give that context of um, why we are like leaning on third-party certifications and reusables as a standard at Mason, um, and also incorporate their feedback um, into resource development. Like, we didn't know that there are entertainment ride riders at Mason and those sort of like unique concerns that happen, you know, here. Um, yeah, so in terms of creating like a culture of reuse on campus, uh, there are a couple strategies that we're really working on right now. Um, so we're supporting a student-led pilot um, at that grab-and-go facility um, on, on our Fairfax campus. So they're creating like a kiosk and uh, we're going to test out a reusable to-go system there. Um, we're, we're working with our Patriot Green Fund again to sort of like uh, eliminate it, that application barrier for um, finding that supplemental funding for uh, water uh, filling station retrofits. We have over just over like a hundred, I think, refill stations throughout Mason's campuses. But um, um, expanding those and exploring options for even outdoor fillers is something that we're um, definitely interested in doing. Um, and also, we recently um, piloted with Philip Ford for our annual Green Game event. So really leveraging sort of um, established sustainability events and. Um, event giveaways to promote that culture of reuse and um, resource sharing at Mason. And yeah, um, in terms of the front of house pilot composting um, that I talked about. Um, so uh, in order to make sure that like, when we um, halt to free state that those materials, um, you know, aren't contaminated and, and that we can continue that uh, partnership long term. We really are focused on piloting um, at a few key locations. Um, and one of those is that Starbucks uh, coffee shop I mentioned. So we have an ongoing Big Belly Solar pilot up uh, on the exterior patio, and we're adding a third composting unit in next month. So we were able to sort of like leverage an existing pilot to expand it to interior bins within the coffee shop. And um, additionally, we have another pilot going on where we're auditing uh, existing composting locations, um, which is more sort of like back of house kitchen based at our three dining hall locations on campus. So yeah, on, ongoing challenges. Um, we would not recommend uh, the timeline uh, for our implementation to anyone. Um, so it was, you know, a great opportunity to be able to accelerate um, some of these changes that we've been working on for a while. But the quick sort of turnaround of standing up purchasing changes within dining locations, since some of them had to open pretty much immediately over the summer was pretty difficult, along with um, sort of changes in supply chain uh, availability and larger, the larger context of fiscal services changes at the university. Um, the office hours were really helpful for kind of communicating um, directly with uh, campus stakeholders about reusables. Um, but, you know, the ongoing public health emergency uh, with COVID-19 definitely added some complexity to, to supporting reuse on campus. Um, and yeah, composting safety, uh, we don't really have any uh, state um, like um, labeling regulation for composting the way some states like California and Washington do. So we really relied on third party certifications um, to ensure that the, you know, what we were um, immediately purchasing had long term sort of like disposal 
um, con considerations in mind and um, you know, avoided uh, PFAS contamination at Free State site. And um, one of the things uh, we would definitely promote um, campuses of, a, of our size to do is especially like um, investing in more standardized and centralized uh, waste infrastructure uh, prior to the ban where that's an ongoing effort, but coordinating that is definitely, um, you know, a difficulty. Um, some of the things that really worked for us were, you know, using that partnership as a model um, for the implementation, you know, we worked really closely with other Virginia universities in Daishi, reached out to universities that have implemented plastic bans successfully, and, um, you know, sought out their advice and, and uh, as well as like stakeholders in our university um, to sort of crowdsource solutions to trickier problems. Um, yeah, and we, through our office hours, we tried to be as transparent as possible about, you know, why, why the motivations behind this ban, why it's important and really leaning into third party and reuse uh, standards um, to implement it. Yep, and I think that's it. Tried to get through that pretty quickly, <laughs> thanks. Thank you so much, Kevin, Colleen and Amber. Um, it's pretty remarkable given the short timeline, how much you've accomplished. Um, there's a ton of questions that have come in. Uh, I know we're not going to get to all of them, but um, I just want to kick off my, I have one question, then we'll move to the other, to the panel um, attendees questions. Um, but something that I think um, people generally focus on when they hear single use plastic bans are those, you know, bev dining and beverage and food packaging. And I really want to like um, put Kevin on the spot here because I know I um, have some major hesitations and worries about reusable bags for our collection and our recycling staff and our custodial staff. Um, so Kevin, can you speak briefly to that process and the transition and how it's working with your staff and how they've, um, how they've you know, made that transition and adapted to using reusable bags for collection? Yeah, sure. So what's nice is uh, I work with also a group of uh, special needs uh, guys who I have a staff of about 20 special needs. And, and of course, as you know, these guys are fo zero focus in on what we ask them to do. So they've always used recyclable bags from like we've always used it with them. Now, when it came to my full time staff and transitioning with these guys, um, I am added it to their route, put it in their trucks and uh, it works out because again, when we go into buildings, um, they will empty their recyclable materials into those reusable bags. Now, if it's a building that's, that has a lot, instead of going back and forth to the truck, they do have the plastic bags accessible to them to fill up one bag versus keep numerous bags over and over going in a building. So they can fill up one plastic bag with that reusable bag versus going in the building with multiple plastic bags. So we repeatedly use the usable bag, if that makes sense. I would love it if um, maybe you could share um, some of your, you know, your vendor or who you're using and, and just a little bit of that process with us um, afterwards. And we can certainly get that out in our follow-up um, email. Um, Along those lines of the items that are um, banned, can you speak to, um, is it just dining and food packaging or what, what are all the plastics that are listed in the, and it is a state mandate, right, from your governor? Yeah, oh, <laughs> I, um, I'll just, I'll, and then Colleen can add. Um, so we, it is um, largely food service that was in the cessation, which was uh, so the cessation was like a phase one, basically, and it was very rapid, um, uh, about three months to phase out all, you know, uh, food service items. So that was the first focus of that reference list. Um, I did just want to mention, I, I put, um, and I'll, I'll put it in the chat again, I don't know if it went out to everyone, but a uh, webpage uh, that the um, Circular Economy Zero Waste Task Force has a bunch of uh, materials, including that reference list. I will note, because Colleen will, will get it later if I don't, that um, uh, it is that reference list is now dated because we put it out last year as a one-time snapshot of, okay, here's the products out there on the market. They have current certification. So I just want to note that it is a dated 
reference list in terms of we knew at the time that that specific SKU had BPI certification. Colleen and I poured through thousands of product lists and SKUs. Um, so it was a one time, but it's a good, it's still a good primer. It's still a good uh, uh, reference. And then you can go to the, it has links to the websites where you can find the materials. So if you're interested in that, uh, we'll put the um, CZW uh, task force website in the uh, chat. Um, so yes, food service is a large portion, 100, over 100,000 pounds. Uh, we eliminated over 100,000 pounds of single-use plastics from food service. We're a very large institution, so that was just immediately, that was something we had to eliminate. There are a lot of other um, items in the phase-out. Um, by weight, we, so the, the, um, the mandate is you, you have to, you know, um, do things by density and weight. So plastic bottles are very, uh, you know, um, very, they tip the scales a lot because it is, a, you know, a very uh, dense uh, product, uh, the PET. So um, we got rid of all uh, water bottles within that uh, few month period. And that's the big, you know, uh, plastic bottle. So we, we got rid of a lot of plastic bottles right up front. There are a lot of other things in phase out. Uh, the phase out is until 2025. We're trying to do things earlier. We have to get a 25% reduction year over year. So we have to choose of those other items um, besides food service, what, you know, how to take a 25% reduction from our baseline. So um, this year uh, we should be uh, eliminating small uh, trash bags from offices, things like that. Um, large trash bags are a bit, uh, you know, a bit scary of an item. We're trying to figure that out. Uh, uh, Kevin obviously does work on the reusable on the low residue front, but if you think about for trash, it is, it is a hard one. I think one of the solutions in the meantime is to go to, you know, high content recycled plastic bags just for that sourcing piece, but then it is just being burned. Um, and also, again, to Kevin's point, co-locate reduce the number of bins, get these compactor bins so that you have less plastic bags. Um, so again, we're just trying to reduce, reduce, reduce. Um, there are things like glitter in there. There are things like balloons. Uh, when we talked to some of the purchasers on campus, they were like, oh yes, please take glitter away. <laughs> um, so, you know, it just depends what people are actually frustrated with. Colleen can tell you from some of the office hours that the thing that people were most annoyed with was probably uh, the K cups. Um, so we, you know, it's interesting to interact with folks and see what really is, it would be hard for them to get rid of. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that we've worked with um, uh, the bookstore and others to replace their packaging tape to paper tape. So we may not be able to get rid of everyone's scotch tape, but we're trying to find the large volume sources of plastic. And uh, since tape was in this thing as well, you know, find, you know, where we're not going to ask our electricians to stop using, uh, you know, their tape, but we might ask, you know, these large uh, packagers to start using paper tape, that kind of thing. So uh, Colleen, did I miss anything or Lena, was that good? I mean, I think there's probably a million more things you could add. I think it just kind of goes to show that this is such a huge challenge. And again, that you you are pulling this off with such a short timeline. And hopefully our we're up to 121 attendees here um, are able to take this information and kind of get ahead of it and start thinking about a lot of these materials so that um, and they can um, do have as, as successful as an implementation as possible and really think beyond those dining materials. So thank you both, or thank you all three. Um, I'm going to go back to our screen here. Um, and um, we'd like to move to the College of the Atlantic. So thank you, Colleen and Kevin and Amber. Um, so next we're gonna hear from the College of the Atlantic. Um, Tina Drupa, Ellie White, and Izzy Segovia are senior year students of human ecology at the College of the Atlantic in Maine. They have engaged with environmental work since their first year by co-chairing the Campus Committee for Sustainability and coordinating the college's activist group, Earth in Brackets. In 2019, they brought COA to be the first college campus in the country to sign on to the Break Free from Plastic Campus Pledge 
and have continued to expand these efforts beyond the pledge. So thank you for joining us, Tina, Ellie, and Izzy. Go ahead and take it away. And while you are speaking, I would ask that maybe Colleen, Amber, and Kevin, if you could work on answering some of those questions in the Q&A, um, because there are a lot of them. Thank you. <laughs> yeah uh hi everyone uh we're happy to be here and present our uh, campus's journey to sign break free from plastic pledge created by post landfill action network as we were the first college in the u.s to uh, sign it and um so we were a lot a big part of the process of um um, taking part in the process. <laughs> uh, we are the team that carried uh, this through in late 2019 and have continuously, as mentioned, um, engaged with other zero waste efforts through our time here. And for the context, College of Atlantic is a small liberal arts college of uh, 350 students plus uh, 100 staff and faculty. Um, we are located in Maine, Bar Harbor on the coast of Atlantic Ocean. And um, it's important to note that uh, we are, we don't have separate departments and it's uh, highly interdisciplinary, which creates uh, in some parts leverage for making change faster. And, um, uh, but of course we will share also the challenges of it. Uh, since the creation of the college, we have been focusing on sustainability as it's been it's uh, one of the core values. And of course, with time and responding to the wider context, it has shifted. And uh, so uh, the composting has been on campus since 97, 1970s and, um, and Princeton Review has rated us as the greenest uh, college in North America for six years in a row. So there are uh, many efforts that are made in order, not, not, in, not only to single use plastic ban. And uh, further, we will lay out the process that allow to achieve this ban. Um, this includes the structure of COA policies implemented and frameworks of these goals, as well as uh, student governance involvement uh, and the staff help that made it possible. And um, so further, uh, I, so COA, as we don't, we don't have separate uh, student governance, uh, instead our students, faculty and staff work together to govern college as a collaborative decision-making process. Students serve as, uh, as full voting members on nearly all colleges com committees, including faculty review committees, uh, whether we want composting toilets in our building or having premenstrual products in bathrooms. Um, indeed, the college community as a whole maintains a, a strong commitment to uh, board participatory governance, which is important uh, because it has further helped uh, the process of implementing the pledge and other efforts as it um, working together with uh, staff. So uh, the core group uh, groups on campus for this uh, pledge to be implemented came from Campus uh, Committee for Sustainability, which is one of the committees in the school and has been always and historically co-chaired by students. So most, most of the work is uh, voluntarily done by students and um, it's primarily responsible for assessing all aspects of accessing plan campus conditions to determine the most efficient and effective ways to develop a more sustainable campus. So all the on-campus activities including policy creation, development, and review, reviewing such as paper, furniture, maintenance, electricity, and sorts of um, all, all from all different kinds of aspects, as well as organizing informational sessions, designing discarded resource spaces in, in uh, buildings, and collaborating 
further with other organizations such as Post Landfill Action Network and um, Earth and oh, sorry Earth and Brackets ha, is uh, our college's environmental activist group that takes uh, part in multiple scales, for example, in this case, campus and otherwise also initiatives, uh, activist initiatives on town and also international scale. Yeah, so before we start talking about the single use plastic um, ban that we have on campus, it's kind of important, I think, and Tina's already mentioned discarded, discarded resources um, to speak about how we kind of envisage waste. Um, and so for us, we kind of feel as though every word evokes a frame and um, that frame kind of mediates how we interact with the world and how we um, kind of relate to certain structures. And so we think that waste um, carries associations of loss and disposability and valuelessness um, and that waste is kind of a, um, a problem of human conception in that um, it obviously has physical consequences, as all of us here know, but uh, the solution, at least at COA, has seemed to be um, one that can be solved in part by linguistics. And so at COA, waste is not used to describe the physical resource that is discarded, but it is a verb. Um, um, and so it's an action, you know, we're thinking about um, what it is to waste. And this kind of links to the zero waste movement's use of the term to waste. Um, which is to unnecessarily discard a resource uh, so that its value is not fully realized. And so from here on out throughout our presentation, um, we're gonna call waste or trash or garbage a discarded resource. Um, and that's what we call trash on campus. If there's any signs around, it says discarded resources, not trash, um, because it recognizes the inner value of a resource that cannot be realized once it's thrown out. And so with this evolving terminology, we are kind of constructing a visionary frame um, that doesn't value, uh, that doesn't label resources as invaluable or people or places as disposable. Um, and so how does this, what does discarded resources mean in action? Um, so from this evolving terminology, um, we created the discarded resources and materials management policy. Um, so here is the Campus Committee for Sustainability talking in an all-college meeting. Um, and the first policy draft of the discarded resources and materials management um, was passed in March 2017. Um, and this was done by a majority vote of all people on campus. Um, and discarded resources and materials management refers to the procedures, practices, um, which are designed to achieve a reduction in resource consumption and wastage, and also encourages an increase in resource reuse and a mitigation of greenhouse gas production on campus. Um, and so we're kind of wanting to establish a more holistic approach to the complex topics of resource production and consumption and disposal. And within this policy, um, it's measured by diversion away from landfill. The policy set um, a really kind of hopeful and optimistic goal of 90% diversion of discarded resources by 2025, based on the weight of the college's discarded resources in 2015, which is hefty. <laughs> and the interim goal uh, was 70% diversion of uh, resources away from landfill by 2020, which we actually achieved um, by 2008. Uh, we achieved in 2020 before the pandemic. <laughs> um, and furthermore, the policy sets a goal to reach 90% of diversion by 2025. Um, unfortunately, these efforts have been paused by COVID and we're going to speak more to that. Yes, so looking a little bit more in the details of like the connection from our goal, uh, the effect of um, COA's language and image um, including actual images, like posters, the ones you can see on the far left are like some, uh, an example of the signs that we have right now, um, given the pandemic situation of like fifth year recycling. And as Ellie mentioned, um, we like carry through like the whole campus, like this very clear messaging of like the way we relate to or discard resources. So in every single bean um, and this, um, spaces where we discover resources like there's like 
this blessed uh, differentiation of like the seven um, different sections in which um, we discard our resources. Um, and also that goes along a little bit further with um, the way we also relate as in students, because that is part of our work study um, position. And so that creates like a closer relationship to like the people living on campus and like working here and studying and creating our lives here, like to relate and see our peers also working there. And you know, that, that brings it closer rather than having an external um, yeah, group of people like working for this uh, purpose. So um, yeah, we also have an uh, apron, which I think that's just like a very specific example of like how that shift of perception towards waste um, is aimed to be like not as something that is dirty, but something that is like of higher esteem that you know like you want to engage with. Um, so yeah, the, something else to point out is the visibility of our scattered resources stations, which are usually in the middle of the architecture uh, in the different buildings through the campus. So that has been done in purpose um, in a way that we want to acknowledge this and we want to be able to, to deal with it and don't feel detached, but actually part of how much we want to engage with um, or the scattered resources. And here's an example of um, a diagram from 2017, which was the year that um, the policy was signed. And as you can see, um, the numbers we have like selected in the waste audits, um, we have divided like what are the percentage that we have for like, different items. And to give you a little bit more of information how the waste audit works, um, it is collected through a time of a week uh, from different parts of the campus. So like the residential areas, classrooms, the offices, um, the cafeteria. So all of that is like put together in this tent where students um, sort through it and they like, um, let's say categorize it in 13 different sections. So those will be, as you can see there, um, you know, like trash envelopes, letter parks, package, packaging materials, different types of plastic, glass, and so on. Um, and we have this little video like through the speakers, but we just wanted to show you a little bit of an example of how this process is. Um, to also just like give you some other, um, yeah, like something else to grasp up upon of what we are all talking, which is a little bit maybe uh, theoretical, but so you can see like how it is done in action. Uh, Design, make, rethink, reach out, research. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> not working super well right now. But yeah, you can imagine as you can. On the compost that like made aware. In the video that uh, that's a very kind of close up uh, relationship with uh, the kind of resources. And uh, next. Uh, so as a part of, of this like, um, how to say, culture that we have in the campus, we decided to be part of like the break uh, from Plastic Pledge, um, which uh, we signed in 2019, being, as Tina mentioned at the beginning, the first college in the US to be part of this. And all of this came to be um, after we attended a conference of students for COAs um, hosted by PLAN, Post Landfill Action Network. Um, where we met Alex, who is the co-founder of the network. And he just told us about this pledge where they were about to launch. And we got like, engaged in this conversation where we realized that many of the things that they were asking for campuses to engage with uh, were things that we were already doing at COA. So we decided to be part of this, but not necessarily for a goal of um, embracing something that we were not already doing, but more we were more interested in creating this relationship with other campuses that were also interested in stepping away for single-use plastic. Um, so as uh, Ellie mentioned already, we had the policy, the standard resources policy, which had already covering many of the points. Uh, and some of them would be the phases and the phases of um, the pledge are, for example, um, the first one and the second one, the main difference is that in the first phase, um, you eliminate 
campus and campus food vendors procurement of all non-essential and non-compostable single-use disposable plastic, such as uh, single-use utensils, uh, straws, food service ware, like cup plates, and we're, we're already not using those. And the second phase, um, it's more uh, keeping an eye towards plastic-free alternatives in future procurements. Uh, and that will involve things such as uh, plastic trash and recycling bags and single use plastic use in academic settings such as lab equipment. Um, and Ellie will now go a little bit more in detail on how that conversation with, went with the different professors and for the different like, classes and arrangement. But just something else that I would like to note on is the accessibility and how we didn't want it to be a ban on purpose. Um, so we will like ensure that people uh, will have, wouldn't have a problem um, accessing the basic means that we'll have. Uh, and an example of that would be the free menstrual products that we have in our bathrooms, um, which are sometimes um, with some like plastic wrap, uh, but we didn't want to be a, yeah, a problem to access that for the, the people here. Yeah, so in thinking through a kind of blanket bans and how we measure single-use plastic on our campuses, uh, we kind of had to evolve our framework once again and evolve uh, the terminologies that we were using. Um, because through our work with the post landfill Action Network, we kind of realized that the diversion metric just isn't perhaps the way that we want to go on our campus because it doesn't measure waste reduction. Um, which is what we should be aiming for, as shown on the zero waste hierarchy that you can see in front of us. Um, and so a week before um, our campus closed due to COVID, we proposed um, a change uh, to our discarded resources and materials management policy, um, which as I mentioned earlier, originally set a goal of 90% diversion of discarded resources away from landfill by 2025. Um, and instead, we wanted to change it um, because the diversion metric doesn't measure reduction in resource consumption and wastage and can actually incentivize uh, recycling and composting, which is obviously at that middle ranking of the zero waste hierarchy. And so we've kind of, um, we're kind of playing with figures right now and seeing what will pass through our governance system, but we're hoping for um, a 5% reduction. Of discarded resources um, by 2025 to be our goal um, but it's still being discussed in our meetings and so we can't promise anything <laughs> but fingers crossed that will get passed um, and one thing that we've kind of struggled with in this process of changing these frameworks in such a short period of time um, is just cultures change slowly as I'm sure many of you know and our campus Although we're only small, we kind of follow suit. It is these changes aren't aren't quick. They <laughs> they they take a long time. Um, and so through Atlas, um, we kind of realised how slow this process is because we were having to engage with all staff and faculty that had um, the ability to procure items for their departments. Um, and so it meant that Tina and I and other people who are part of the Campus Committee for Sustainability were going around and talking to every individual um, to see um, kind of what materials we could um, either reuse or reduce. Um, and this Atlas certification, once again, is from the Post Landfill Action Network. Um, and in a similar way to George Mason, it's kind of incentivizing buying less and buying better. Um, and so we're working a lot with our um, college financial officer who oversees almost all procurement. Um, and so, yeah, a big, a big part of this process is creating these partnerships um, between departments and putting all of the people in the same room um, through all college meetings. Um, and so, yeah, Tina. <laughs> so just uh, to put into uh, the context, we recognize that our campus have a specific governance system and because of the size and the way it's set up, it has been helpful to make these changes, but rather uh, sharing this uh, and thinking about direct trans uh, transferability, we want to share our holistic approach to the zero waste work that 
requires not only thinking about waste directly, but as Izzy and Ellie mentioned, the culture of it, and frame, or, and not only thinking about waste, but the framing of relationships and processes um, with uh, people and these uh, materials uh, th through the college. And um, being small scale has its positive sides. However, we are students and we have been doing the work and most of it, it's not compensated, which are setbacks of being more creative and even more collaborative between people who are compensated or uh, the ones who have clear responsibilities or would overlap. And, uh, and lastly, um, each, as each institution has its own specifics, therefore, kind of our story is about uh, taking advantage of that we are small and we were able to go inch wide and mile deep in this and think about the culture and reach people personally. Um, yeah. And that's it. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Tina, Ellie, and Izzy. This is fantastic. Um, I just want to say that it was so, I was so happy to invite students to present. Um, you know, you're obviously our key stakeholders and constituents at colleges and universities, but I think you've shown um, from your example at College of the Atlantic that you are leaders and partners, as we talked about with the, the GMU presentation as well. Um, partnerships are key. Uh, we have just a minute for some questions um and i'll just kick it off with you know what do you what would you tell most of the people on this call um the hundred and so participants are staff um what would you say as students is your greatest contribution or how you would most like to be perceived by staff as partners in this process i think we've been very fortunate in that um we are seen as uh, kind of co-producers of our college here. Um, many of the meetings that we had were with our college president, which I know again is so rare, but we were lucky enough to kind of be respected enough and seen as leaders so much that, um, yeah, there was no question as to whether we'd have meetings with our president. There was no question as to whether our procurement officer would um, welcome us into those circles. And so I think for us, that's kind of a big thing of being open mm -hmm. to, um, raising the voices of students and um, giving them access to these spaces to, to have conversations. And I think just to add on that, um, by doing that, I think that also opens uh, the room for students themselves to take seriously responsibility because there's really, you know, like this, um, like trust with you. So like you kind of try to give the best you have uh, in order to, you know, not disappoint yourself or like, just the group of people who are also working with you. So I think that's like, it plays two ways. One, to open the space and also the other way to put students ourselves to feel that, you know, we need to be out for it. <laughs> and of course, like it, it puts in a frame of that you don't expect the change to happen, but you are the one who is framing it and pushing for it. And therefore people come joining you and, and uh, going through the process. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pull up our last slide, but I do want to just point out that there's a number of comments in the chat, uh, and I second and third all of them that um, your your holistic approach to changing the culture, the changing of your language, how you speak about discarded resources, I think is really critical, and and it complements all of the operational. Um, work that has to happen as well for us to ban single-use plastics. So thank you all. Um, and uh, I, I um, will share a follow-up email with resources if anybody um, would, um, or the, if our panelists can, can share this with us, we will we'll be sending that out. Um, and just really a quick wrap up. Um, as I mentioned, this is the first of our series for 2022. Our next uh, webinar will be Earth Week, April 21st. I know it's a busy time, but hopefully everyone can join us for an hour. The theme will be measuring waste as a scope three emission, which is an emerging um, topic for many campuses. Uh, we have one um, presenter already selected, uh, but so we would welcome everybody to submit a proposal to be a presenter. You can find that um, interest form at, at kirk3r.org. Maybe Jamie, if you can put that link in there in the chat real quick. Um, 
Additionally, if you go to kirk3r.org, you'll find um, in a few days today's presentation recording and the slides as well as past webinars. And then lastly, I'll just mention that um, this spring we have some openings for our Kirk board uh, members. So please keep an eye out for um, an invitation for applications coming out in late March because um, we can only put this together with dedicated individuals um, like some of the folks on the call here, Kevin and Jamie and all the other board members. So we welcome you to um, apply to join us on the Kirk board. Um, so I thank you all. Please join me again in thanking Kevin and Colleen, Amber, Tina, Ellie, and Izzy for their wonderful presentations today. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at another Kirk webinar. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. If there's unanswered questions, do you want us to keep answering, or do you want us do you, do you want to send those along in a something else for later? Or I am hoping that because we're recording, that I can go back and capture the Q and A. Um, I don't know if anybody's had that experience before. Um, yeah. So that's my hope. Um, if you have a couple of minutes, I will leave this open and you can answer them. And, sure. um, and maybe I can do a couple of screenshots just in case. Say, yeah, and there's some here. participants still uh, in the thing. I'm wondering if they're waiting for questions to be answered. Um, we'll keep answering on the chat. Um, and I don't know if you want us to answer any of them live, but I'm happy to stay around for a few more minutes for that. Um, if there's anybody that's still on, we have 11 attendees um, still on, if you are waiting for your question to be answered, you can pop your name in the chat or pop your question in the chat and, um, and um, our panelists can answer them while they're also feverishly typing away answers. I think, one yeah so there's these questions about vendors like the one that connie just put in around like being a pepsi campus and what does that mean when you're trying to work with those big uh companies and then also i think the other kind of recurring thing had to do around like when there were added costs like how were those factored in um or like any kind of cost benefit analysis or any kind of that side of things yeah, happy. I think there's a few of those in there, so I'll just yeah. um, I'll just jump in and, and answer it maybe verbally here. Um, you know, I'll say that you know with the executive action, it obviously helps uh, to um, you know smooth out any you know there's a requirement to meet this you know governor mandated type of action. However, I will just say that. Um, our campus is dedicated to this, um, so I think um as we started out the partnership with business services and office of sustainability it was really for that fiscal and environmental resource responsibility so the business services actually did some of the cost benefit analyses and we also set, shared with them some case studies about other schools who have done this already um and so they did do you know you know what kind of profits would they lose what kind of um, issues would they have and, and things like that. And there is a cost. Uh, there is a cost. Um, however, you know, it really is just whether your university or your organization is willing to um, bear the cost and whether there are other co benefits that you're not, like, whether there are other, you know, uh, cost savings or ROIs that you're going to get on other uh, return on investments that you're going to get on other actions that you take. Um, for instance, money that we may lose from you know vending or things like that we will likely gain back on the zero waste uh, facility side of things because we are uh, getting better revenues back from uh, recyclable items that have higher revenue potential um, and we're just reducing the number of hours to sort through things and and, and things like that so there's a lot of um, shared costs and i think one of the things that can be so important about the partnership across campus with different departments is that one budget incurs a cost, one budget, you know, benefits from it. Can those folks work together 
um, to, you know, uh, share the burden, sort of, so to speak. So we actually, you know, I will say that, you know, because business services was a big part of um, our action, um, I think it went pretty smoothly with, uh, you know, vendors or, um, you know, uh, folks, you know, so we, um, we have catering contracts that have been changed that you have to, you know, use compostable items if you want to, you know, bring items to our campus. We have, um, you know, vendors who we worked, uh, Colleen knows this, uh, we worked um, with each vendor um, on campus and there are many, uh, including Sodexo, who is a, manages many sites on campus and then there are independent vendors as well. We worked with each one uh, looking through every item that they purchase to get that inventory. And then we also showed them what the uh, uh, compostable alternative could be. Um, it is a, a little bit higher cost for them. So there's a bunch of financial analysis you do need to do. Um, and it's really walking through with each vendor, um, you know, with business services that really changed the game. So I'll say, I'll say that. And, and, um, and then business services and, and others being willing to, you um, understand that this is this does cost but it the the end result is important thank you for that amber um i actually have to pop off because my son has to go back to school for a musical uh he got, got a part in the musical so i have to take him back to do the read through but i'm gonna leave um the zoom open for, um, you know, until I get back. And that way you guys can um, complete um, filling out those Q&A answers um, and feel free to um, respond to any more of the questions that might come through in the chat. Um, you can see the attendees uh, list. Yeah. Do, um, do you wanna stop the recording? Yeah, we could also share like our email or contact info if people want to follow up that way. Um, we'll likely do that if you're okay with that in yeah, the, sure. um, the follow-up email. Um, yeah, that'd be so great. Do that as well. Um, I think, I guess the biggest thing for me is, is trying to figure out how to capture the questions and answers after, um, after the, uh, the webinar is over and I close it. Yeah, and I just want to point out a resource because they, they may, uh, folks may end up sending questions that we have answered on our circular economy zero waste um, web page. And so I just want to caution Colleen has a lot of work to do in general. Um, so I don't want to like just put her out there for, you know, uh, every email answering. Yep. But um, the circular economy zero waste task force website that we have at Mason um, outlines a bunch of guidelines, including what was eliminated, the timelines, the reference list, why it's important is in the reference list, what our alternatives are. Within that reference list, there's actually, uh, to Connie's question, there's a, uh, you know, um, here are the paper alternatives that you are allowed to buy at Mason. They have to be 100% recycled content or FSC certified. Uh, Connie, because of the speed, like three weeks that we had to switch we had to lean on those third, third party certifications. So no, we didn't do a specific study on that, but we knew that if we didn't require FSC certification or 100% recycled, um, that it would just end up being, uh, you know, the cheapest. But actually I will say like the, the uh, recycled content and FSC certified bags aren't that much more expensive than a different type of paper bag. So plastic is cheap. I will say that no matter what, alternative single use alternative you're switching to plastic and that polystyrene would typically be cheaper um but you know that's that's kind of you know the butt there that you just have to you know the vendors um had to take on an additional cost and we um you know we just worked with them on okay but here's here's the alternative and then if you switch to reusables typically um, those reusables pay themselves back after six uses. So that's for comp against compostables. It's about 30 uses against plastic. So, you know, again, reusable, 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 reduce, reduce, reduce. Those are our main takeaways. Yeah. I'm going to have to head out as well, but 
Thank yeah. you again. This is great. Thank I you. really appreciate the opportunity to be part of the discussion. Thank you. I was able to actually able to do screenshots of all the questions oh, and nice. the answers. So um, if I can't save it somehow through Zoom, we'll have them captured. Um, and uh, I will share that link um, for some of your resources um, in the um, Colleen in the um, follow up email. So thank you both. Thank you thank all. You. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Very informative. And I will hopefully be right behind you guys soon with the <laughs> <plastic> band. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.